Did you know the true story behind the movie Changeling and the town of Mira Loma, California share a chilling history? Truth really is stranger than fiction. Now let me tell you a story about innocent boys, a trickster, and a twisted chicken farmer and his mother. I'm Amy, and this is True Crime Recaps, bringing you all the crime in half the time. Our story starts around 5 p.m. on Saturday, March 10th, 1928, in a working-class neighborhood in Los Angeles called Lincoln Heights. Christine Collins was starting to panic. She'd given her nine-year-old son, Walter, money to go to the movies, but it was dinner time, and he still wasn't home. She was a single mother while her husband was serving time for robbery at Folsom Prison. She called the police right away, but they made light of the situation and told her that the boy had probably just run off. But Christine knew better. There was no reason for Walter to run away. She insisted that he had been kidnapped. A search party was formed, but there was no sign of him. However, everyone had their theories. Walter's father figured a former inmate took him as revenge. He worked in the prison kitchen and part of his job was snitching on other prisoners, but that lead didn't go anywhere. Another woman reported seeing a boy about Walter's age in a car with two people. She remembered the boy was upset and crying, but she couldn't give a very good description of the people he was with or the car that they were driving. Other witnesses came forward to say that in the days leading up to his disappearance, an Italian-looking man and woman had been asking questions about where Walter lived, but they couldn't give any specifics either about these mysterious strangers. A month later, the police were out of clues, and for the most part, they kind of washed their hands of the whole thing. They figured, eh, they were right all along. The boy was a runaway. The thing was, Walter wasn't the only little boy to disappear in the area around that time. A month earlier, on February 2nd, a burlap bag was found in a ditch. Inside was the headless body of a boy named Alvin Gothia. He'd been shot in the heart with a 22 caliber rifle. Two months after Walter went missing, 30 miles away, Nilsson and Lewis Winslow, 10 and 12 years old, they never made it home after a model yacht club meeting. A short time later, their parents got a strange letter telling them not to worry. The boys had gone to Mexico and they weren't coming back until they were famous. But the police weren't connecting any dots between those boys and Walter. But his mother refused to give up hope. Five months went by when out of the blue, a miracle happened. Walter had been found alive and well in DeKalb, Illinois, almost 2,000 miles away. Thanking God for answering her prayer, she bought the boy a train ticket to Los Angeles and waited eagerly for her son to return. And meanwhile, the LAPD were congratulating themselves on their successful investigation and making sure the media knew the long-lost Walter Collins was coming home to his mother thanks to their efforts. And sure enough, the newspapers and her friends and neighbors turned up at the train station to see the reunion. But when the boy got off the train, Christine got an awful shock. He was not her son. She tried to tell police captain J.J. Jones what she suspected. Now, she knew her own son, and whoever this boy was, he wasn't her child. But the captain refused to listen. He wasn't about to go to the press and admit they had the wrong kid, so he decided to ignore her. He tried to convince her the boy was her son, saying it had been five months. The boy had undergone who knows what trauma, so maybe he just seemed different. He told her to take Walter home and try the boy out for a while. Maybe she would change her mind. True statement. Can you believe it? But what else could she do? All eyes were on her, so she took the boy home. She had some questions. If this person was her son, how did he end up in Illinois? What had happened to him? But Walter was strangely quiet on the subject. And when he did talk to the police, they couldn't get a straight answer out of him. He just didn't want to talk about it. Three weeks went by, and Christine was 100% sure she was taking care of a stranger's son while the real Walter was still out there somewhere, except now no one was looking for him. She was desperate to make the police believe they had the wrong boy. She brought in dental records as proof that the boys were different, but not only did Captain Jones refuse to concede he had made a mistake, he actually had her committed. Her only crime was the possible humiliation of the LAPD, but 
it was easy to lock her up thanks to something called the Code 12 Internment Clause, which allowed the police to have you committed or jailed if you were being difficult. She was subjected to electroshock, sedatives, and other treatments to cure her of her hysteria, all in the name of forcing her to agree that this strange kid was actually her son. But no matter what they did to her, she refused to say it. Now, who knows how long she might have been kept there if it weren't for the fact that on the 10th day, Walter finally came clean and admitted, all right, he wasn't the real boy. He wasn't even the same age. At first, he said his real name was Billy Fields, but it didn't take long to discover that that was also a lie. His real, real name was Arthur Hutchins Jr. He was 12 years old. Oh, here's how Arthur became Walter. His biological mother died when he was nine, and he hated his stepmother and wanted to get away from her. Around the same time Walter disappeared in California, Arthur ran away in Iowa. When he got picked up by the police in Illinois, they noticed how much he resembled the missing Walter Collins. They started asking him questions. That's when Arthur realized, yeah, he's on to something here. If he agreed that he was Walter, then he could get a ticket to Los Angeles and a whole new life in the bargain. So just like that, Arthur became Walter and the police, anxious to close the case with a happy ending, eh, they didn't ask too many questions. So now that there was irrefutable proof that Christine had been right all along, she wasn't just a hysterical woman, she was set free. And what did the LAPD and specifically Captain J.J. Jones have to say for themselves? About as much as you'd expect, which is not much. She filed a lawsuit against Captain Jones and was awarded $10,800 for her pain and suffering. She planned to use the money to finance the continued search for her real son, but the captain refused to pay her and he never did. The only punishment he got was a four-month suspension for forcing a strange boy into her life and sending her to a mental institution for complaining about it. As for Arthur Hutchins, he became a traveling carny selling concessions. From there, he ended up back in California working as a horse trainer and a jockey. He was only 38 when he died from a blood clot, leaving behind a wife, a daughter, and a truly bizarre story. But... This story isn't over yet. At the same time Christine and the rest of the country were learning the truth about Arthur slash Walter, another boy 50 miles north of Los Angeles was going through a hell of his own. His name was Sanford Clark. He'd moved from Canada two years earlier to live with his uncle and his grandmother in Wineville, California. Never heard of Wineville? That's because what I'm about to tell you was so horrifying. The town changed its name to Miraloma just to avoid being associated with this story. Oh, here's what happened. 19-year-old Gordon Stewart Northcott and his mother, Sarah Louise, offered to take Sanford back to Wineville with them so he could help out on the little farm they had there. They raised chickens and made a living in selling eggs and hens. Now, Sanford was only 15, but at the time it wasn't unusual for a teenage boy to leave home for the chance to work and send some money back to his family. And that's just what Sanford did. But his letters home started to get a little weird. Nothing specific, but his sister Jessie had a feeling that something was wrong. She traveled all the way to Wineville to see for herself what was going on, and as soon as she got there, she knew she was right to worry. Gordon was aggressive and moody. It was obvious he was trying to keep her from being alone with Sanford, even to the point of threatening her, but she refused to leave until she got the truth from her brother. And one night, while Gordon and Sarah Louise were sleeping, Sanford told her about the things he'd seen on the farm. Well, Gordon was physically and sexually abusing Sanford and other boys. He lured some of them through help wanted ads he placed in newspapers asking for farm hands. Others he just snatched off the street and kept locked up in the chicken coops. Not only would he rape these boys, but he claimed he also rented or sold them to rich pedophiles. When the boys got to be too much to handle or when he tired of them, Gordon used his 22 or an axe to end their lives. Quick lime decomposed their bodies faster and their bones were buried in various places on the farm or burned in the desert. The very next day, Jessie traveled home and repeated to her mother what Sanford had told her. Her mother called the U.S. Embassy in Canada and they alerted the law in Wineville. Now, as the story goes, when Gordon saw the police approaching the farm, he ordered Sanford to do whatever it took to stall them. <laughs> By this time, Sanford knew his uncle was someone to be afraid of, so he tried his best to keep the police away, giving his uncle and grandmother time to get away. Left on his own, 
Sanford spilled the whole sordid story, including the fact that one of the boys murdered in the chicken coop was nine-year-old Walter Collins. He said Walter had been there, locked in the chicken coops, tortured and abused for about a week before he was killed. Small pieces of his body and the clothes he was wearing when he disappeared were eventually found in the chicken coop. Nelson and Louis Winslow had also fallen victim to Gordon and his mother, Sarah Louise. Remnants of their library books and clothes were found in the chicken coops. Detectives even found a note written on the same paper as the letter sent to their parents, but this letter was only a few words. It said, don't worry, we are fine. Later, Sanford admitted that Gordon had forced him to help him murder one of the Winslow boys. As for Alvin Gothia, the headless boy in the burlap sack, Sanford said Gordon shot him, dumped the body, then brought his head back to the farm and smashed it into little pieces to bury. In total shock, hardly daring to believe what they were hearing was true, the police searched the farm with Sanford acting as their guide, pointing out the grave sites on the ranch. But what the boy didn't know was that Sarah and Gordon had already excavated many of the bodies and taken the remains into the desert to burn them. Now, much later, partial remains would be found of still more victims in the desert outside of town. But as police dug under the chicken coops, they found enough gruesome evidence to convince them that Gordon and his mother were serial killers of children. The earth they dug up was soaked with blood. The remains of small human fingers and ankle bones were everywhere. They even found what was left of a bloody mattress and an axe covered with a combination of chicken blood and human. Gordon and Sarah Louise managed to escape across the border to Canada before they were captured in British Columbia. Now, reports say they were smug and cocky, thinking the extradition process back to California would take years and they were better off in Canada. Gordon even sold his story to a Canadian newspaper, saying that the rumors of the chicken coop murders were exaggerated and he'd only fled to Canada for the sake of his poor little mother, Sarah Louise. So, you know, she wouldn't have to deal with the harsh spotlight of the lying media in California. And he might have been right about the formal extradition process, but he never had the chance to find out because the American lawman on his case just up and hauled him onto a train bound for California, and that was it. In December 1928, Gordon confessed to killing the Winslow brothers and Alvin Gothia. His nephew Sanford claimed there were many more, and Gordon himself hinted that there might be as many as 20 victims. He also reportedly gave the names of some of the rich, well-known clients that came to him for boys. But those names, if he really shared them, those were never published. The one murder he would not admit to was that of Walter Collins, not even when Christine herself came to visit him in prison and begged him to tell her if he'd taken her son. However, his mother, Sarah Louise, did confess to Walter's murder, along with the murders of the other three, although she later changed her story. She was convicted for Walter's murder. She also had something else shocking to admit about her son, Gordon. She told the jury he was the product of incest between her husband and her daughter, Winifred, Sanford's mother. Now, whether it was true or not, there's no way of knowing, but whatever her reasons, it didn't work. October 2nd, 1930 was Gordon's last day on earth. It's been said that when he woke up that morning, he screamed and cried in fear of the noose that was waiting for him that afternoon. He even asked if it would hurt. How ironic coming from a man who raped and murdered little boys with an axe. He had to be dragged up the 13 steps to the gallows, and when he got to the platform, he collapsed. The noose was fitted around his neck, and he was rolled through the trap door where he strangled to death. His final words in this life were, A prayer. Please say a prayer for me. As for his mother, she was paroled in May 1940, and she moved to Maryland, where she died four years later from heart disease. In 1930, the same year Gordon was executed, the citizens of Wineville voted to change the name of the town to Mira Loma, as it still is today. And as of 2009, the Northcott House still stands, although the chicken coops were torn down. As for Christine Collins, until the day she died at the age of 75 on December 8, 1964, she never gave up hope that Gordon Northcott had been telling the truth and her son Walter was not a victim of the chicken coop murders since police were never able to find his entire body. She lived alone in the same neighborhood under different aliases to escape media attention for the rest of her life, 
always hoping that her son would find his way back to her. And that is your very sad recap. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, we appreciate it so much. If you give this a thumbs up and remember to subscribe and hit the bell so you never miss a new recap. Until next time, take care.